Welcome to Brother Miller's Notes. I'm so glad you're with me today as we study 2 Kings chapter 2 through 7. Now just a few highlights. Here's where we're headed today. First, do you have Gehazi's disease? Just so you know, I write that on the board if I'm teaching this in a lesson and or maybe on a slide That's as students come in. I want to be able to think about this because this part of that lesson, of this lesson is so relevant and applicable today. Uh, second highlight, we're going to recognize the passing of a mantle. We're also going to talk about how God's not limited by our faith or by our resources, but he often asks us to do our part before he does his. And also one other highlight, God blesses us with what we need and then some. So as we start out with 2 Kings chapter 2, the old king passes away and a new king comes in, into play. Haziah. Now he's just like his dad, Ahab, but maybe even a little bit worse. And we'll just see that. If you have a very important question, an impersonal question, who do you ask? Uh, maybe some of you are saying, I got some family, I just trust them. Maybe I've got a really good friend. Maybe that personal, important, time or sensitive question, I'll go counsel with my bishop, my priesthood leader. In James chapter 1, verse 5, it says, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of Google. Just kidding. I hope you like that little picture I grabbed. That's not what it says. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who giveth to all men liberally, freely, abundantly. Well, the king of Israel falls through a lattice. And he thinks he may die. And he wants to know. It's kind of time sensitive, very important to him. Am I going to die? He doesn't send for the prophet or ask a family member or ask really good friends. What he does is he lacks that wisdom and he goes and asks Balzabub. Now, Balzabub is a god of a Philistine uh, city, Ekron. Balzabub is known as the Prince of Devils. If you look at kind of on a map, kind of see what this king's trying to do. This is the king of the northern tribe of Israel. He is in Samaria. That's his capital. And he is saying, go to this little town of Ekron, which is the northern part of the Philistine state, and ask that God, am I going to live or not? Well, he sends out his little uh, messengers to go find out. And Elijah intercepts them and asks the question, is it because there's no God in Israel to inquire of his word? Well, these uh, messengers go back and the king goes, nah, describe him. Who, who, who kind of intercepted you and sent you back? Oh, he was a hairy man. Uh-oh, Elijah. Harry probably refers to that he's, had, uh, he's having a Nazarite vow, he's not cutting his hair right now for whatever reason. And the king thinks, oh, well, I'll just send a captain with his 50 men and I'll just go tell Elijah, come down and talk to me. So 2 Kings chapter 1, verse 9, and the king sent him a captain of 50 with his 50. And he went up unto him and behold, he, Elijah, sat on top of a hill. And he, captain, spake unto him, Elijah, thou son of God, the king hath said, come down. Try to do that in a captain's voice. Hopefully that works doesn't work for Elijah, fire is sent down from heaven and destroys them. Well, there's a second captain, 50, who's asked to do the same thing. Verse 11, And also he, thou the king, sent unto him, Elijah, another captain of 50, with his 50. And he answered and said unto him, Elijah, O man of... Oh, wait, I'll do this in my Batman voice. O man of God, thus hath the king said, come down quickly. I only got two voices. Neither of them are very good. But you know, even if you do it in a cool voice doesn't work not being very respectful. Fire comes down from heaven. Well, there's a third captain in his 50. He's a lot brighter than the first two. Recognizes what's going on, and he knows the magic word. Please, pretty, pretty, please. I like the caption to this comic. And King Haziah sent the third captain with 50 men to get Elijah. After passing 102 charred bodies, Captain Number 3 decides to use the magical word. Please. But once again, Elijah asks, 
as he meets with the king. Is it because there's no God in Israel to inquire of his word? We should answer that question today. Is there a God in Israel that we can inquire of his word through a prophet? The answer is yes. God speaks to modern Israel today through his mouthpiece, a prophet. Yes, we can receive personal revelation for things of our life. Yes, there are peace people who are have a calling and are set apart and given authority to have revelation for the people in, in their uh, their sphere. And maybe that is a, a Relief Society president, an elders quorum president, or a bishop. But there is one who speaks for God, for not just modern-day Israel, but for the entire world. In 2 Kings chapter 9 comes to pass, they went over, Elijah says unto Elisha, now let me pause here. It's not that Elisha comes out of the woodwork, out of nowhere. Let me talk a little bit about Elisha. Because Elisha wasn't part of the reading of last week. But in 1 Kings 19, he's introduced. That's six or seven years before the end of Elijah's mortal ministry. The Lord reveals to him that Elisha is going to be his successor. Elijah goes to meet him. Finds Elisha plowing a field and calls him to be an assistant. I think it's kind of similar to, to uh, Christ going up to the apostles. Follow me. Peter leaves his nets and follows Christ. Elijah invites him. Come follow me. Assist me. And Elisha does. Elisha kisses his parents goodbye. Gave away all he owns. Arose and went after Elijah and ministered unto him. Elisha is an eyewitness to the power of Elijah's priesthood keys and his faith. He's there when Elijah confronts King Ahab and Queen Jezebel and reproves them of the murder of Naboth. Elijah twice calls down fire from heaven to consume the 50 soldiers sent by the king to arrest him. He's an eyewitness when Elijah rebukes Ahab's son, King Isaiah, for seeking counsel from false gods and prophesying of Isaiah's imminent death in 2 Kings chapter 1. Elisha is loyal to the prophet Elijah. Elisha felt like Elijah was like a father to him. There's the relationship with Elisha and who a little bit about who he is. Now back to these verses in 2 Kings chapter 2. That Elijah said unto Elisha, Ask what I shall do for thee before I be taken away from thee. Elijah has a very good idea. I'm about to be translated. I'm about to go away. And it seems everybody knows it. Elisha said unto thee, I pray thee, let a double portion of thy spirit come upon me. A double portion is a birthright blessing. To be the successor. Now, Elijah knows he's going to be the successor, but to have that birthright blessing, a double portion of the spirit, that's not his to give. That's God's to give. And he, verse 10, said, Thou hast asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if thou see me when I am taken from thee, it shall be unto thee. But if not, it shall not be so. If you have the privilege of the spiritual experience of seeing me being translated up, then God's going to prove this. This is really in God's hands. And it came to pass, as they still went on and talked, that behold, there appeared a chariot of fire, and horses of fire, and part of both asunder. And Elijah went up by the whirlwind into heaven. And as he's going up, he casts his mantle. Now, in, in this story, that's the cloak. And when he gets the cloak, this now becomes a symbol of the authority and power of a prophet. The mantle of a prophet. And Elisha takes up the mantle. Now, when he comes in, I'm getting ahead a little bit. When he comes in, the sons of the prophet, they see Elisha and they feel in their hearts. They recognize it's not the piece of clothing. They recognize he now is the prophet. It's not just a piece of clothing that defines a prophet. But this passing of a mantle is felt, and in this case, seen. And it would be just kind of fun just to stop and ask, what's the mantle of a prophet? What does the mantle represent? Can we feel when a mantle is passed from one prophet to another? from one Relief Society president to another.
from one bishop to another. And what can we learn about what the Lord will do when he calls an individual to serve him? Do those individuals feel that mantle being put on them? And when they're released, do they feel the mantle taken off? Well, skipping to verse 15, when the sons of the prophet which were, which were to view at Jericho saw him, Elisha, they said, the spirit, it's not the mantle, it's the spirit of Elijah. There's something special about you. Doth rest on Elisha. They came to meet him and bowed themselves to the ground before him. They know by the spirit, this is the prophet now. But there's also a little bit of lack of understanding the next couple of verses. They're like, yeah, you're the new prophet, but we really, really, really liked Elijah, and he was really cool. That's kind of what they say. Verse 16, And they said unto him, Elisha, Behold now, there be with thy servants fifty strong men. Let them go, we pray thee, and seek thy master. Perhaps Venser, the Spirit of the Lord hath taken him up, and cast him on some mountain or into some valley. Okay, we really, really like Elijah. Let's go find him. We got fifty really, really strong men. They'll go find him. And Elisha, he shall not send. Don't waste your time. 17. And when they urged him till he was ashamed, they're begging him. Elisha knows what's happened to Elijah. There's no need for you to go on a search party. I know what happened to him. And, well, then he says, send. They sent 50 men. They sought their day for three days, found him not. Of course not. He's up in heaven. And 18, and they came again at him, for he tarried at Jericho. And he said to them, Did I not say unto you, go not? I told you so. They recognize the spirit of Elijah's on him, but they long for and seek for the advice of a former prophet. I don't know if that happens very often, where you get the new bishop called, and, and I get the feeling I have that spiritual confirmation. Yeah, he's the new bishop, but... Man, the old bishop told better jokes. Man, the old bishop just knew what to say. And the new bishop, ah. How can we understand the mental of a calling? How can that help us when church leaders are released and when new leaders are called? We don't need to long for and go after and seek the former Relief Society president or elders quorum president. When we know by the Spirit they have the mantle, it's a great lesson for us. So I'm just I'm going to start adding as we go through some of these stories. Here's some lessons from Elisha. Okay, the faithful knew he had the spirit of Elijah. The faithful know he has the calling of the prophet. Now, definition of miracle. It's an effect or an extraordinary event in the physical world that surpasses all known human or natural powers and is ascribed to a supreme natu super supernatural cause. You know, such an effort or event manifesting or considered a work of God. It's a wonder. It's a marvel. A wonderful, surpassing example of some quality or miracle of some modern acoustics. We run into a series of awesome miracles that happen. I mean, the first one is, on his way back, Elisha takes the mantle of Elijah that fell from him, smacks the waters of this river, and said, Where's the Lord God of Elijah? And when he had smitten the waters, they parted hither and thither. Just like Elijah does, Elisha now does. The water split. He walks right over them. Not only do the faithful know by the Spirit, he has the power of God with him. Now he goes to a city. These are faithful men. These are the, the sons of the prophets. Verse 19. Men in the city said unto Elisha, Behold, I pray thee. The situation in the city is pleasant. It's a nice city, as my Lord seeth. But the water is not, and the ground barren. And he, Elisha, said, Bring me a new cruise, bring me a new vessel, and put salt therein. And they brought it unto him. And he went forth into the spring of the waters and cast salt in there. Now that's not the normal cure to purify water source. You don't salt it. And he said, Thus saith the Lord, I have healed these waters, and there shall not be from any thence any more death or barren land. So the waters were healed unto this day, according to the saying of Elisha, which he spoke. Elisha, another lesson, gives God all the credit. It's not Elisha, and it wasn't the salt. It was God. Elisha is the servant of God, 
but the salt is a symbol. Salt can be compared to the Word of God, what God does through a prophet. Salt has over 17,000 uses, but the three majors are it gives flavor, it acts as a preserver, and it can be an antiseptic. The Word of God, what comes from God through a prophet, gives us spiritual flavor. It preserves and it's a spiritual antiseptic. In this case, Elisha is using an object lesson to teach. Here's what God can do for you today. It can heal. Now, by the way, this is one of my all-time favorite, favorite uh, stories in all the Old Testament. He went up, this is Elisha, from thence to Bethel, Beth house El God, house of God. And it was going up, by the way, there came forth little children out of the city, could be translated teenagers. Teenagers out of the city and mocked him and said, Go up, thou bald head, go up, thou bald head. Now you just look at my head. You know why this is one of my favorite stories. I don't think it really has much to do with baldness. They are mocking a prophet. They see in him what they may think is a personal weakness, something that maybe is not quite up to snuff. He doesn't quite look like a prophet should look. And they're mocking him for it. Sometimes in the Old Testament, being bald was also um, associated with being wicked. They could be calling him sinful. They could be calling him wicked. Verse 24, He turns back and looked on them and cursed them in the name of the Lord. And there came forth two she-bears out of the wood and tear forty and two children of them. Lesson, be respectful of prophets. Even if you see a physical flaw in them, maybe you see that they're not perfect and they're not, well, they're not Christ. They have their, their mistakes that they make. Be respectful. Well, 2 Kings chapter 4, and there's a certain woman of the wives of the son of the prophets of Elisha saying, Thy servant, my husband's dead, and thou knowest thy servant did fear the Lord. And the creditors come to take away unto him my two sons to be bondsmen. That's the price. You owe me a debt. I'm going to get you paid by taking your sons for their service. And I said to her, What shall I do for thee? Tell me what thou hast in the house. And she said, Thine handmaid hath not anything in the house save a pot of oil. And he said, Go, borrow three the vessels abroad of all thy neighbors, even empty vessels, Borrow not a few. She does. That's a lot of vessels. And when thou art come in, shut the open door upon thee and thy sons, and thou shalt pour it into all those vessels, and thou shalt set aside that which is full. She went from him, shut the doors, she got all the vessels, she poured out oil. Verse 6, it came to pass when the vessels were full, she said unto her son, Bring me a vessel. And he said unto her, There is not a vessel more. And the oil stayed. And she came and told the man of God, and he said, Go, sell the oil and pay thy debt. You asked for enough oil. Actually, you asked for the debt relief. You didn't ask for the way it was done. God provided the way. God's provided enough oil. Now go sell it. A little more effort. He's not just going to give you a bunch of, of bills, a bunch of money. There's some effort involved. Go sell it. And then you're going to find out you're going to have enough to pay your debt, in verse 7, and enough to live on. God gave this widow what she asked for, maybe not in the way she wanted it, and then some. Well, just some thought questions. Think about what Elijah, Elisha said to do with the oil that blessed her. Why do you think the widow and her sons received more oil than they needed to pay their debts? And what principle can we learn from this account that what will happen when we turn to the Lord in faith? Well, my summary is, God's not limited by our faith or by our resources. But he often asks us to do our part before he does his. And God will bless us with what we need. And then some. Maybe not in the way that we think it should come. But blessings do come. Just maybe not in the way we ask. But God does bless us. Now we get a new character coming in. His name's Gehazi. 
Let me just tell you a little bit about Gehazi. He is Elisha's servant. He is very perceptive of other people's needs. Now, I'm summarizing verses in 2 Kings chapter 4, and you can go through as you study, but just look. I mean, he's perceptive. The question's asked, and he's answering, here's what's going on here. And he says, here's what's needed. In chapter 4, verses 14 17, he sees that a great promise is made and it's fulfilled. He's watching a prophet work. But he lacks charity. And as you see in 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 26 and 27, you have a son who has fallen and hurt its head. And he's like, oh, my head, my head. And it's like he's going to die. But the woman comes, mom, the widow, and has so much faith. And uh, when it comes to Gehazi, and uh, she's faithing, things are going to be okay. Verse 27, when she came into the man of God to the hill, she caught him by the feet. But Gehazi came near to thrust her away. And the man of God said, let her alone. For her soul's vexed from within her. The Lord hath hid it from me and hath not told me. Gehazi sees that she's struggling, she's need. But it's not just, hey, I'm going to prevent you from coming up to the prophet thrusts her away. He lacks charity. Um, he also was called to go and heal the child. Now that's kind of a really cool thing. Elisha says, I've got enough trust in you. You have the authority. You have my permission. Go and do it. And it's very similar. When Joseph Smith, there's a case of malaria and among the saints, and he's been blessing people, healing them from malaria all day. One of the great spiritual outpourings, healing in our dispensation. And he's just tired. He can't do it. And someone comes to him, and he's got some twins on the other side of Montrose. And Joseph can't do it. And he says, okay, Wilford, take my handkerchief. Use my handkerchief. Wipe their foreheads. Heal them. Wilford Woodruff does it. Very similar. Wilford Woodruff has faith. He goes and does it. Gehazi's told to go and do it, but he can't. He lacks the faith to heal. Now, Elisha comes. I know I'm summarizing this whole thing. Elisha comes and heals the child. Gehazi is a witness to the raising of the dead. I mean, he's been a servant. He's seen these miracles. He's been around a prophet. He's felt the spirit. It seems he has a lot of trust, and you have a prophet that's trying to mentor him but he has a flaw. He has Gehazi's disease. Let's talk a little bit about what he has, what he ha what what problem is. But first, a pause from Eli from lessons from Elijah over the healing of this kid. So this is number eight. When Gehazi has an idea, Elisha listens to it and acts on it. That's a great lesson from Elijah. When others have great ideas and you're a leader, listen to them, act on them. And be patient with those who serve around you. When Gehazi lacks charity, he's very patient with Gehazi. And he's trying to help Gehazi learn something. Let's help you participate in this to exercise your faith that you too can do a miracle in the life of others. That's a great lesson from Elisha. Now, before we get back to Gehazi's disease, this is uh, Naaman. He is a Syrian army leader. Syria is the enemy right now. And he has leprosy. And if you want a, just a beautiful video on this, it is one that is very well done. Naaman and Elisha, I'd encourage you to show it to your family or you know, if to uh, your um, Sunday school group. It's at the church's website, media. You can just search church's website, Naaman and Elisha. That's the title of the film. But 2 Kings chapter 5, Naaman comes and wants to be healed, and he calls on the house. Elisha doesn't even come down. You know the story. He sends his servant and says, go and wash in the river Jordan seven times. And now we pick it up, chapter 5, verse 11. But Naaman was wroth and went away and said, Behold, I thought 
he sure would come out to me. I mean, I am kind of important here. And stand and call the name of the Lord his God. I want to look good too. Strike his hand over the place and recover the leper. I think maybe the reason why he has this expectation is because that's the way they do it where he grew up. It's a it's a show. It want everybody's supposed to recognize that the that these false priests and these false gods are doing it. And now a true servant of God just kind of like, no, just go do it on your own. We're not going to be recognized. I don't want to be popular. Just go exercise some faith. Verse 12. Are not Abana and Parfar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? By the way, the answer is yes. May I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned away and went in rage. I mean, this is a picture of the River Jordan. It's not a clean river. It's not like some of these other rivers that are much clearer, much nicer, much bigger. Well, and his servants came near. And I love the video. They do such a good job with this. Verse 13. And spake unto him and said, My father, if the prophet had bid thee do some great thing, wouldst thou not have done it? How much great rather than when he saith that he wash and be clean? A different translation of the Bible. I really like it. My father, it is a great word the prophet has spoken to you. Will you not do it? I like the way that translation is. What the prophets ask you to do is a great thing. He's asking you to be humble. <laughs> He's actually said to you, wash and be clean. Then he went down and dipped himself seven times in Jordan according to the saying of the man of God. And his flesh became like unto the flesh of a little child and he was clean. And he returned to the man of God, he and all his company, and came and stood before him and said, Behold, now I know there is no God in all the earth but in Israel. Now therefore I pay thee, take a blessing of thy servant. I know it and I want to be grateful. And here's how I know how to be grateful. But he, now this is Elisha said, as the Lord liveth. Now that is a big commitment here. I'm covenanting here as the Lord liveth. Before whom I stand, I will receive none. And he urged him to take of it. Please take. I mean, just I want to be show some gratitude. But Elisha, no. And just some thought questions. If you were Naaman, what might have you been thinking the first time you dipped yourself in the water? The second time? The seventh time? Why seven? Seven symbolic of perfection, of coming unto God. Why might we be more willing to do something great and less willing to do something small to keep the commandments? And maybe what small thing has the prophet asked you to do lately? Have you done it? I mean, if the prophet asked you to do something really great thing, yeah, I got it. What about the small things today? The small things every six months in general conference. Well, Naaman offers Elisha the gifts. He refuses. But Gehazi comes back into the scene. Verse 20. Gehazi, the servant of Elisha, the man of God, said, ah, Behold, my mather spared Naaman the Syrian in not receiving his hands which he brought. But, <laughs> as the Lord liveth, I will run after him and take somewhat of him. And what he does is really calculating. He runs after him. And Naaman's like, hey, is everything okay? Verse 22, yep, everything's okay. But there's come to me from a couple of these people, from Mount Ephraim, two young men, sons of prophets. You know, I just, they need it. You know, Elisha doesn't need it, but but they need a little something. Maybe just a little bit of silver, talent of silver, two changes of garments, and Naaman's just trying to be generous here. Verse 23, be content. Take two talents. And he urged him and bound two talents of silver in two bags with two changes of garments and laid them upon him of two of his servants, and they bear them before him. Hey, take my servants. Go. You got it. They're going to be guards, because that's two talents of silver. That's quite a bit. So back to Gehazi. He's been around a prophet. He's been witness of miracles. 
He's been invited to participate in miracles. But he has a challenge. He comes back. Verse 25. Stands before Elisha. And Elisha says, Where comest thou, Gehazi? He said, uh, I serve one no, no, nowhere. Uh, no, I didn't go anywhere. And he, Elijah 26, said to him, Went not mine heart with thee? And you're breaking my heart. I know what you did. When the man turned again from his chariot to meet thee, is it a time to receive money and to receive garments and all of yards and vineyards and sheep and oxen and manservants and maidservants? The leprosy, which is symbolic of spiritual sin. Now this is going to be a physical sin, but this is going to be a reminder that you will be stricken with it. There is going to be an emotional cost of what you've done, and you're going to feel it, and a physical cost. The leprosy, therefore, Naaman shall cleave unto thee, and unto thy seed forever. And he went out of his presence as leper, as white as snow. Gehazi's disease seemed to be a part of his pride and his vanity, that he lied. He tries to have be, he's a priestcraft, sells the cure to Naaman. He's a thief. He dishonors the prophet Elisha. And in the presence of a prophet, uh, he was in the presence of a prophet, but was not converted in his heart. Now, I like to think, looking forward, did he change his ways? Did he repent? Well, I think he did. And this is just the way I read the scriptures. This is not part of the Come Follow Me reading, but if you go to 2 Kings chapter 8, and I have a little footnote in my scriptures right here. The king talks with Gehazi, Gehazi, verse 4. The servant, now you pause. You get earlier in this chapter, he's sent out from the presence with his leper. And if you're a leper in the Old Testament, you have no place among those. You have to be away. You're an outcast. Physically, you can't come into people. People can't come to you. If someone says, you see someone come by, you say, unclean, unclean. But now a king is coming and talking with Gehazi, the servant. The fact that the king is coming to him, and he's still in chapter 8, called the servant of the man of God, the servant of Elisha, maybe means he's back in that position. Saying, God, tell me, I pray thee, the great things Elisha has done. And he tells him. So maybe I like to think that there's hope for him and that maybe he repented and things got taken care of. That's the way I see it. So Gehazi, going back to, not only is a witness to the raising of the dead, but if I could summarize Gehazi's disease in one little phrase, he looked beyond the mark. The mark for him was himself. It not, wasn't the conversion of his heart. It wasn't the miracles. It wasn't the prophet. He was focused more on himself selfish. What he should have been looking at is towards God. And that repent and just changed his heart to God. That's why I'm hoping and I'm believing he did, that he had a change of heart. And uh, Elisha, who very much loved him, uh, took him back in. All right. And then this is a little object lesson. I don't, I used to do quite a few, a few object lessons and I don't do very many anymore because I found that my students remember the object lesson and not what was being taught. But this is one that's kind of cool, and I think they remember it. Take a paper clip and just say, can any of you get metal to float on water? And no, 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 no. Here. Here's a paper clip. And you can get that paper clip, and because of the tension of water, and there's going to be air underneath it, and it's so light, you can get it, if you put it down parallel, it will float on water. This is a picture last time I did it in class where you have that paper clip floating on water. And then you get down water and you just come and say, there it is. Hey, anybody want to try? And there'll be some people who come up and they, some of them can do it, some of them can't do it. But that's also what happens with Elisha. Second King 6, he went down with him, came to the River Jordan. They're cutting wood. But as one was felling a beam, got the axe, you're smacking it, 
the axe head fell into the water, and he cried, Alas, master, for it was borrowed. And the man of God said, Where fell it? And he showed him the place. And he cut down a stick and cast it in thither. And the rod iron did swim. Did swim. Therefore he said, Take it up to thee. And he put out his hand and took it. What a small little thing that Elisha prophet takes care of and God performs a miracle to help out someone in their hour of need. President Thomas S. Monson said, Our Heavenly Father is aware of our needs and will help us as we call upon him for assistance. I believe that no concern of ours is too small or insignificant. The Lord is in the details of our lives. And I believe that too. Now, great story, chapter 6, Elisha versus the Syrian army. In just a brief summary of the story, Elisha's there in a town and the Syrian army starts coming up and it's like, oh my, they totally outnumber us. You see the Syrian army all around and the servant of Elisha is petrified. And Elisha's not. And the servant of, of, of Elisha starts to freak out. And then these awesome words from Elisha. Fear not. They that be with us are more than they that be with them. President James E. Faust taught it this way. Be aware that there are invisible hosts watching over you, even as they did Elisha of old. The king of Syria sent hosts of warriors with chariots and horses to capture the prophet Elisha. They came by night and surrounded the city. Elisha's servants, seeing the great hosts, became very frightened and said to Elisha, Alas, my master, what shall we do? And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. And Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire about Elisha. In answer to his servants' frightened questions, Elisha said, Fear not, they that be with us are more than they that be with them. My dear young friends, I believe that unseen spiritual hosts tend you as you seek to do the will of the Lord. Remember the words of Elisha. They that be with us are more than they, be, they that be with them. And that's so true in our lives too. And then I just add this little paraphrase, kind of the rest of the story. Elisha, I mean, in the servants see this whole army of God is there. Elisha could have commanded them, all right, take out this opposing army. They've come to capture me, take them out. But they come down. Elisha prays the Lord for a different solution. Verse 18, make them blind. And the Lord does it. And then Elisha comes out, verse 19, and says, hey, you know, this isn't the way to find that prophet. And Neither is in the city. Just follow me. I'll bring you to the man you seek. Nothing deceptive in there. He's the man. I'm going to bring him to you. And he leads him to Samaria. And backing up, Samaria is the capital of the northern tribe. It's a stronghold. But I love Elisha's compassion. He has God's army on his side. His purpose is not to destroy the Syrian army, but to help them see. Yes, he brings them to the capital in the midst of Syria, a stronghold. And verse 20, as soon as he gets there, he prays that the Lord opens their eyes. They open their eyes, end of verse 20, and saw they're in the midst of Samaria. They're in the midst of the stronghold. And the king of Israel, I mean, just watches. Here comes Elisha, and he's got this whole army, and they're now captive. And Elisha's brought him in, and I can just picture, verse 21, the king of Israel said to Elisha, when he saw them, my father, shall I smite them? Shall I smite them? Shall I smite them? Shall I smite them? I mean, he's just giddy. I can win the war right now. I've got them in my grasp. And now, a lesson on how to deal with enemies when, you, they, when they are in your power. And he answered, thou shalt not smite them. Wouldst thou smite these whom thou hast taken captive with thy sword and with thy bow? set bread and water before them that they may eat and drink and go to their master. That's how you treat an enemy who's clearly in your power. You give them food, give them water. Hey, I want things to work out with us. 
you're an army, this is a time of war, go back to your king. It's an inspired decision as well. Verse 23, provisions are prepared. They eat, drink, got provisions on their way. And I love verse 23. So the bands of Syria came no more into the land of Israel. Because an inspired prophet shows compassion and is just following what God wants him to do. Well, some teaching thoughts. Just maybe things to emphasize. Do you have Gehazi's disease? <laughs> Why do people miss the mark? They can be around great leaders and great families. They can see miracles happen in the merit life of their family, in their lives. But why do they miss the mark? Maybe they miss the mark because that conversion hasn't happened yet. They haven't turned their heart yet to God. And maybe it's a great time to, to just pause and say, so far this year, how's our study in the Come Follow Me helped us hit the mark? Turn our hearts to Christ. Be more Christ-focused, acting like Christ, being an instrument in his hand. What have we learned so far this year that's helping us do that? And that wrecking the passing, ma passing of a mantle. You could ask that in the in the middle of a of a lesson. When you when we had the light, you can just do this elders corps president, this relief society president, this bishop, this stake president. When did you know? By the Spirit, the new bishop was called of God. And God's not limited by our faith or our resources, but he often asks us to do our part before he does his. And God blesses us with what we need, and he's a God of abundance. He blesses us more abundantly. And maybe that last application, what small thing has the prophet asked us to do recently? And have we done it? Thank you so much for spending a little bit of time with me as we study 2 Kings chapters 2 through 7. Have a great day. Keep smiling.